Hello, everyone. I'm Tim Hansen. I'm the marketing coordinator here at Miratech. Thank you for joining us on this Fundamentals of Industrial Acoustics and Silencer Solutions webinar. Uh, I have our panelists, Mahmoud, Mark, and Mike, and they are going to give us a great presentation in about 45 minutes time. Um, if you have any questions, you can please submit them in our questions um, option here, and we'll get to them at the end. And then also a recorded version of this will be made available at the end as well. So guys, take it away. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> we have a very nice turnout today, so I want to thank everybody for joining us and taking the time out of their schedules. Uh, quick agenda. I'm going to be spending about probably five to six minutes, uh, give you a brief overview of Miratech. And we'll spend the majority of our time uh, diving into the fundamentals of acoustics with the mood, our director of acoustics. And then we'll finish up with uh, Mark. He's going to be discussing our engineered solutions at the very end. So I'll go ahead and kick it off here. Uh, in my 10 years with Miratech, uh, I spent a lot of my time in the field discussing emission and sound regulations and how to help our customers achieve their goals. Uh, after many of those conversations, I found that sound terminology and really sound in general can be a very confusing topic. Some of the questions I've heard out there are, what is sound pressure? What is sound power? What is dB versus dBA? And the big question, is how do we reduce sound coming from those industrial engines and blowers to protect our operators and also meet the regulations that are out there. So our goal today is to try to bring some clarity to you regarding acoustical terminology and help you understand how we approach the challenge of reducing noise. Uh, like Tim said, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type those in the question answer box. We should have a few minutes to address a couple questions at the end, but if we don't address those uh, during the presentations, we'll take them offline after the presentation. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, so you understand who we are and why we do what we do. I like to take a look at our vision and our mission statement. Our vision is to be the global leader in industrial engine emission and acoustic solutions. Our, our mission is to improve the environment by reducing noise and pollutants from industrial engines through partnerships with customers. And I wanna stop right there because I believe that's the key to our success is when we have strong partnerships, like those of you on the call today, we can learn from each other and take on some of those tough challenges regarding emissions or sound. <clears throat> so quick company overview uh, we will be celebrating our 30 year anniversary next year and in the beginning we started out mostly providing catalytic converter solutions for gas and power generation markets and throughout the past 29 years we've done an excellent job expanding our offerings by acquiring companies like EM and Cal uh, they're well-known brands in the industrial and OEM markets. Uh, Americam, who's our catalyst manufacturing arm. Uh, Vapor Phase, specializing in waste heat recovery silencers. And as of late, uh, Aerosonic in Sintal, Germany. Uh, and they provide catalysts and silencing solutions. So throughout these acquisitions, we've been able to increase our manufacturing capabilities, uh, our engineering resources, have a global reach, and most importantly, we've gained a lot of experts in different markets we serve. So as you can see uh, here to the top, our corporate office is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, there's a nice picture right down to the bottom right. We have four manufacturing plants in North America, and we also have manufacturing internationally. Uh, to the bottom left, you'll see uh, those catalyst and silencer products, which Mark will dive into a little bit more later. And to the bottom right is an overview of our capabilities, including uh, what we really put an emphasis on our design and application engineering. Uh, we put a lot of work into research and development. 
Uh, we now have global sales support, uh, technical support, as well as aftermarket services. So here's a quick snapshot of the four markets we serve, uh, power generation, gas compression, industrial marine, and OEM. And throughout these four markets, we've designed, manufactured, and sold emission and acoustical solutions to almost every engine you can imagine. Uh, we also have provided many silencing solutions to the non-engine markets, which include, for example, positive displacement blowers and blowdown and vent silencers. So today, the bulk of our conversation will revolve around fundamentals of acoustics, and those, uh, our discussion will can apply to all those four markets we serve. However, with limited time today, we will focus mostly on those engineered solutions for the industrial, OEM, and marine markets toward the end of the presentation. Um, in our industrial OEM market, we have a variety of industrial applications, as you can see, mining, construction, power generation, marine, rail, uh, as well as vacuum trucks. And to the bottom right, it's a quick snapshot of some of those pollutants we can reduce uh, with our three-way diesel oxidation, EPF, and SCR systems. <clears throat> so as you can see here, we work with a variety of customers and a variety of applications, uh, but we always have the same goal in mind. And that's to provide the best solution based on our customers prioritizing those competing goals. Some folks might just need the lowest cost solution. Some might want to or have a specific sound target to hit. Uh, others might have limited space or a weight requirement. Um, so we try to accommodate whatever our goals are, uh, our goals that our customers are trying to achieve. <clears throat> So this, this slide gives you a visual uh, on where we provide some of our silencing solutions for the non-engine applications. Uh, some of those popular silencers are the intake and discharge silencers, the positive displacement blowers. Uh, as you can see here, they're on a truck. Uh, so we provide those for vacuum trucks, sewer trucks, and uh, other municipality trucks. Uh, we also have um, a few pictures here of our vent and blowdown silencers that we provide noise reduction for. Uh, my last slide, also mentioned earlier, we have hundreds of thousands of successful application installations for our marine market. Some of our products uh, include spark arresters, inline silencers, low pressure silencers. Um, and we also offer emission reducing solutions and EPFs for power generators in our marine market. So that's the end of my, uh, me here. I'm now going to kick it off to Mahmoud, our Director of Acoustics, to discuss the bulk of our conversation revolved around the fundamentals of acoustics. Uh, good afternoon, guys. Uh, this is Mahmoud, as uh, Mike uh, said. Uh, I have been in this industry for more than 22 years. Uh, some of you may know me, some of you may not, uh, but uh, uh, I have been in this, I have been around uh, in this industry for quite some time now. Uh, without going into further delay, I'm going to dive right into it. Uh, in this presentation, we will try to go over fundamental of acoustics uh, as it relates to our industry. It's a huge topic, and we won't be able to cover it uh, completely, but uh, uh, I'll try to cover uh, some basics and some of the common things that we come across on day-to-day -day basis. So let's start with sound. What is sound? Sound is the fluctuation of pressure in air. So for example, when a guitarist uh, hit a string, the string vibrates. This vibration of a spring creates some compression and decompression of air around it. Uh, it can be seen or represented by these lines if you see uh, uh, the picture in the middle. Uh, this compression and decompression is also represented by, can be represented by waves. Uh, it's very similar to the case when you throw a stone in a pond 
and it creates waves and waves travel outward until it uh, hit something or they die away. Sound is very similar. Uh, the only difference is uh, the sound waves, rather than going in a circle, they go in a sphere. They go in every direction possible. Uh, and uh, the sound waves, each sound consists of thousands of frequencies and waves. So uh, unlike water wave, which is probably a single wave moving outward, sound wave consists of uh, uh, thousands of frequencies. Uh, higher the frequency, uh, shorter the wavelength, and vice versa. Uh, if you look at the bottom of the image, uh, bottom image, you will see the frequencies shown on the bottom. The, the, the lower the frequency, bigger the wavelength. Sound can be wanted or unwanted. A wanted sound will be a music that we'd like to hear, while uh, a sound that we don't like is uh, called noise. Uh, we are in the business of uh, taking care of noise. These fluctuations in pressures are very low. Pressure is normally measured in either uh, pounds per square inch or inches of water. But these fluctuations are so small, if you want to represent them in a PSI or, or inches of water, it would be 0 0.0000 and a crazy small number. So we decided to come up with a different scale that measures a small pressure. It is uh, called decibel and represented by dB. In an essence, it tells you how loud the noise is. Oops. A typical engine noise, as I said, uh, each noise consists of thousands and thousands of frequencies. A typical engine noise is shown in the graph uh, in blue. You can see that at the bottom, there are thousands of frequencies, and each frequency has a noise level in dB uh, for each band. Engine produces up to 2,000 hertz uh, frequencies. Uh, but not everybody uh, is sen uh, sensitive to all frequencies. For example, uh, humans are sensitive to hear anywhere from 31 hertz to approximately 19,000 hertz. Elephant, on the other hand, can hear low frequency, 5 hertz to 30 hertz. Low frequency travel very long distance. That's why you often heard uh, in the documentaries that elephant can communicate in a uh, long distance. That is the reason. Bats, on the other hand, can, can only hear high frequencies, say 20,000 hertz to 1,000 kilohertz. So when they are gossiping, we don't hear about it. Now, it's not practical to analyze 20,000 numbers every time. So we decided to group them into 27 one-third of the band. So what we did, for example, we took uh, all the frequencies uh, in a certain area and logarithmically added them to make a one third octave band. So this way we converted all the audible ra range, humans audible range, into 27 uh, octave bands. Even 27 numbers were too many sometimes, so we decided to even uh, combine them into only nine octave bands. So in the graph, blue is the, the frequency, uh, the graph in frequencies by each frequency. That one is the one third octave band and the green is the octave band. As we continue, uh, these nine octave bands are further combined into a single number, uh, which we call overall noise. So sometimes you will have my engine is making uh, 120 dB uh, A overall noise. So while the combining mix is, is easy to communicate. We lose a lot of good information. For example, when we combine it, we don't know which frequency has the high noise level and which uh, did not. Human sensitivity. We are not equally sensitive. All We have an audible range. And then even in that audible range, we are not equally sensitive to all frequencies. If we divide our audible range into low, mid, and high frequency, represented by here on the in the 
the table, uh, orange would be the low frequency, green would be the mid frequency, and blue would be the, will be the high frequency. Humans are very sensitive to high frequency. We are not as sensitive to the uh, mid frequency, and we are least sensitive to the low frequency. So if we show a noise, engine noise, for example, or a blower noise uh, in, in a blue line, this is what the fluctuation of pressure are produced by the engine or the blower. Now, to humans, we will feel it like the orange line. For example, in 1000 Hertz, we are very sensitive. So if the noise is 85 dBA, it will feel to us as 85 dBA loud. I'm using the word loud, uh, although this is not the real representation. Uh, but uh, on, uh, on a 63 Hertz band, for example, the noise could be 95 Hertz, while it will feel as 60 Hertz to us. So we, we don't hear the low frequency very well. We are not sensitive to it. It's a, it's a good thing though. So that uh, produced the need to come up with a, with a scale uh, that represent how a sound will uh, sound to us. Uh, we came up with the A weighted scale and that's why sometimes you will see the noise is given in dB, which is the actual pressure fluctuation. And sometimes it is given in dBA to represent how that pressure fluctuation will feel to a human being. It is common to show the noise level of individual bands in dB while the overall in dBA. Sometimes uh, some raw noise data will be individual bands will be given in dBA uh, uh, and the overall will also be given in dBA or sometimes uh, the individual bands will be given in dB but the overall will be given in dBA. But regardless whether it is given in dB or dBA, we just need to know what it is. You can communicate to us. We can, uh, it can be converted from one to other or vice versa. Sound is energy. Energy adds up. In a simplified term, when the two sounds of equal strength come together, they accumulate, uh, uh, they have a cumulative effect and they add 3 dB to the overall noise. Uh, but if the two noise sources are about 120 uh, dB apart from each other, then the lower noise won't have any contribution to the higher, higher noise level. So what does that mean? Let's say a singer is singing and producing a 120 dBA noise level, and the audience is sitting at some distance, and the distance reduction, say, is 10 dB, then to the audience, it will feel like 110 dB noise level. If we add another singer with the same 120 dB noise level, again, 10 dB distance reduction, now, rather than having an 110 dB noise level for the audience, it will go up by 3 dB because there are two equal source, uh, source noise uh, or sound there. Similarly, if there are three, it won't go to 116, it will go to 114.8. And as I said, uh, if uh, the difference between the two, one is 120, the other one is 100 dB, the difference is 20, to the audience, there will be no cumulative effect. Uh, this 100 dB will have no contribution and to the audience, it will still feel 110 dBA. So this is a rule of thumb and a general way of uh, uh, adding or cumulate, uh, finding the contribution of different noise sources into one. But that's a simplified way. Realistically, the noise sources are added frequency by frequency. You, you saw earlier, that frequent, uh, each noise has thousands of frequencies. So each frequency will add to the other source frequency and a very complex number will come up. But we, we are not gonna go into that detail. Two different noises can change the spectrum. So in the example below, although the uh, one singer is producing 120 dBA noise level and the other musician is doing 100 dBA, Although the noise level will remain 110 dBA, but the definition of the noise will change. The song will feel different. So that's the difference. So, but in, in our industry, uh, we just follow the simplified rule. 
The other term that you very com uh, uh, commonly hear is sound power and pressure. Uh, sound power is always calculated while the sound pressure is measured. And both of them are represented by levels. So you will have sound power level and sound pressure level. A sound power level is the total uh, sound energy emitted by a source. So let's say you have a tailpipe, whatever the sound energy is coming out of it, that's the sound power. Now, whether you standing one meter from it or 10 meter from it, to get the sound power, you have to add all the sound that comes out of the tailpipe. So regardless, if you are at uh, one meter or 10 meter, you will always end up with the same number. So the sound power does not change with distance because it is the total energy uh, emitted by the source. Sound pressure level, on the other hand, is uh, distance dependent as you go away, because this is the sound pressure level at a particular point. So as you go away, more and more so, uh, sound will spread in a bigger and bigger area or sphere, and less and less will get to a certain point. So that's why sound pressure level always have a distance associated with it. And as you go away, sound pressure level will go down. Now, uh, the sound can uh, disperse in a sphere or hemisphere or in a different shape. If you have a very long tailpipe, then the noise can spread in a sphere because there will be nothing around it. But if you have an enclosure and the tailpipe comes out of the, the roof of the enclosure, then you have the roof underneath. So the noise cannot go down into the enclosure. So it will spread in a hemisphere. So if you have a sound power and you know that it is gonna be dispersing in a sphere, uh, you can use this rule of thumb to convert uh, sound power to sound pressure or vice versa. For a sphere, you subtract 11, and for hemisphere, you subtract 7.8 to get to the sound pressure level at one meter. Now, in a free field, every time you double the distance, noise goes down by 6 dB or 6 dBA. Now, you go from one meter to two meter, it will go down 6 dB, two meter to four meter, 6 dB, 100 meter to 200 meter, it will still go down by 6 dB. So all, every time you double the distance, it will go down 6 dB, but that is in the free field, meaning there should be no reflective surfaces, no walls, no trees, nothing. Uh, it should be an open field environment. In a real life, normally it is less than 6 dB reduction every time you double the distance. Noise has some directivity element as well, uh, meaning if a, a sound is coming from a source, most of it will go in the front. It will go everywhere, but a little bit more will go in the front and a little bit less will go in the back, which means it has some directivity element to it, but it's not much. It, it normally goes in all directions. Reverberation or reflection, noise reflects. So if you have a source and you have a reflective surface, the noise will go, hit that surface and come back. So if the, if the reflective surface is too close, it will come back and remember, uh, it could add up. It will act as a second source. So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, important that when you are doing the testing, there should be no reflective surface uh, nearby or you should not be standing uh, behind the meter. Uh, to explain uh, the, the reflection of, of noise, uh, take your phone and let's say you are playing a music uh, in an open field outside you probably would be able to hear the song, but very, uh, it will not be loud enough. But if you take a, take a glass, make sure it's empty, it doesn't have beer in it. Uh, you put your uh, uh, phone into the glass, you will see all of a sudden, now you will hear the song much louder. What happened? Because of the gla glass wall, sound cannot go. Uh, some will pass through the glass as well, but most of it will reflect back and add. And remember that 3 dB rule. So your noise, although the source is one, the wall of the, the glass will act as a secondary source and you will have a cumulative effect and you will hear that the, the, uh, the song will be louder now. So that's why it's uh, uh, the, the sound reflects 
and the reflective uh, reflective surfaces can affect the sound pressure level or uh, sound pressure level sorry now now noise reduction is normally represented uh, by either insertion loss or transmission loss or attenuation these three terms are interchangeably used but there is a difference between insertion loss and transmission loss insertion loss account for the reflection and the surrounding and the source and where it is uh, what's after the muffler what's before the muffler but transmission loss does not uh, i won't go into too much detail i think uh, as it is we are running a little late so but uh, there's a difference you care about the customer care about the insertion loss what we can calculate is the transmission loss uh, now the two engines can have a different noise spectrum why it is important to have a different uh, noise spectrum you can see i have shown two examples engine one engine two uh, in the blue is the the raw noise you can see that both engines overall the last uh, column 116 116 both have the same overall noise level but engine one has 63 hertz dominant noise 140 db while engine two has 4000 hertz dominant frequency which is 113 same silencer is applied uh, the second row or the gray row uh, uh, so the insertion loss is shown here in both the engines uh, in engine one the the silencer will reduce the noise by 23 db in, uh, in engine two case it will only reduce by 77 db oh sorry 17 db uh, so you can see that the two engine may have the same overall noise, but the spectrum could be different. So the same silencer can perform totally different on two different engines. So it is uh, what that tells you. It tells you that it is critical to know the spectrum to tell what the silencer will do. And second, uh, the uh, same silencer can perform very differently on two different engines. So without a raw noise spectrum, we cannot tell what a silencer can do. Uh, if somebody does, it's a total guess. Uh, the same example is shown with the graph as well. Now, uh, I think I'm very proud uh, to say that uh, in Meritech, engineering is very strong. We have uh a lot of tools and very smart engineers uh, that are always there to to help you uh, we have an innovation center where we do emission testing all the time to improve or uh, or develop new products uh, uh, we have in-house engineers and more than 50 years of combined experience in acoustics and emission uh, we use solidworks a common platform for 3d modeling uh, it's easy to communicate uh, between uh, uh, customer and, and us. Uh, we can provide 3D models. We do uh, computational fluid dynamics a lot. Uh, whenever we need, we can easily do FEA, element, uh, FEA analysis. All these capabilities are in-house. We don't need to go outside. We, uh, we have the manpower and uh, the engineers who can do uh, these sorts of analysis in-house. For acoustics, uh, we use uh, SimCenter 3D. It is uh, the leading 3D uh, acoustical modeling software out there. Uh, we use it, uh, as you can see on the, on the top right, uh, we use uh, this software to develop new products. Uh, the example shown is for our i-series. So we, we uh, configured different configurations, uh, analyzed it, and then finalized our design. On the bottom left, uh, you, uh, there was a case where a customer has a tone and the frequency issue at 49 Hertz. Customer approached us. Uh, they wanted to add a, a side branch resonator uh, of 49 Hertz. We were easily able to, easily and successfully able to add that uh, resonator into the system to resolve customer issue. So we can do all these sorts of analysis whenever there is a need for it. 
Uh, we have a couple of uh, sound meters. One of them is a BNK sound meter, very slick meter, in my opinion, at least. Silencer selection. It's a tricky business. Uh, there are many competing goals uh, when you are selecting and sizing a silencer. Uh, you would think that the, all silencers are designed for acoustics. Uh, acoustics is the main function of a muffler, but you will be surprised that how many mufflers are not selected or designed for acoustics. Many are designed for physical size. Many are designed for weight limitations. Many are designed for or selected for back pressure and some for cost. Uh, Sometimes a customer will push us uh, for a smaller connection size. We have to be very careful in cases where we use a smaller connection because smaller con connections or a smaller body or a smaller silencer uh, can produce uh, flow noise. So the silencer would be reducing the noise and then we will be producing it after the silencer, say in an elbow, or, or a, a T connection, or, uh, or if we are putting a, a choking the flow, the noise may be produced after the silencer, and then there will be nothing to knock that noise down. So it is critical uh, to know what the, the goals are and prioritize them. If it is for acoustics, tell us. The more you know, the better we can design or select the muffler for you. And that's my last, last slide. I hope uh, you learned a thing thing or two uh, from this presentation. Uh, I'll pass it to Mark, uh, who has some interesting stuff to share. Great. Well, thanks, Mahmood. Really appreciate that. Hey, everybody. As, as Mahmood said, my name is Mark Wilk, and I have the privilege of being one of the sales managers here at Miratech Corporation. Uh, and once again, thanks for everybody for just taking some time out of your day to attend this webinar. So Mahmoud did a really nice job of explaining to everyone how the, the complexity of sound and how it works, right? So now that we have a better understanding of how it works, let's spend a little bit of time talking about what products we can support you with to help you hit those sound targets. Just, okay, great. So, you know, from a silencer standpoint, with Miratech, we have a wide array of silencers that are all geared toward hitting your noise requir requirements. For our EM silencer series, we basically have four main categories that we can support you with. The first category over here is our EM J line. So these are our cylindrical silencers, and they're gonna cover a wide range of applications. They're gonna, they're gonna be able to support you from a silencer standpoint for a one inch to a 48 inch diameter. And we also have the opportunity to include options like you know, reactive and absorptive silencing features for to help you achieve better sound attenuation. Our EMD, our EMD line, these are our disc silencers and they're great for enclosed applications. So it's really a great fit for, uh, you know, packaged power or other options where space, other applications, excuse me, where space is limited. Um, and we'll be able to support you for anything ranging in size from four to 20 inches from an inlet standpoint. Our EMO silencer, these are our oval, oval silencers, and this is great for low profile applications where you need to work inside a very quiet environment. That oval des design really does a nice job of giving you that low profile, while at the same time giving you a high degree of attenuation as well. So we see this a lot in our stationary applications as well as marine and mobile applications. And last but not least, we do have a spark arresting silencer as well, should you need one. Um, so obviously, you know, key markets for us there would be marine, forestry, oil and gas, and so on and so forth. So in addition to our EM silencer line, we also have our great cowl silencer line. And I love these little guys. So th these silencers, they're great because they're small, but they're an incredibly robust silencer. Um, you know, inside here is a unique spiral chamber that allows you to achieve a very high level of sound attenuation with very low back pressure. And these guys, they're about a third of the size of a cylindrical silencer and about half of the weight with a similar performance, which is very advantageous, especially if space is a concern or weight is a concern for you. So th these are great for any application where your space is limited and back pressure is a concern. 
Uh, we move a lot of these within the marine the, within the marine market, as well as uh, some vacuum truck applications as well. In addition to the silencers, we also have all the fittings and the accessories that you that you would need as well for your exhaust components. Uh, we have a full portfolio of those components that we can that we can help you with. Uh, you know, as an organization, we like to say that we can help you out from from turbo to the rain cap. So should you need flanges, any mounting solutions, piping, flex accessories, so on and so forth, uh, the team is always happy to to work with you on providing you those solutions. So where are these products made? Regarding our manufacturing uh, our manufacturing capabilities, we're deep. We actually have eight production facilities spread throughout the world so that we can support our, our ever-increasing global footprint. Uh, of those eight locations, four of them are located here in the United States, and then four of them are overseas. So we talked about the EM silencer line, and those are actually going to be made in our prior lake facility up in Minnesota, um, state-of-the-art facility. And then the cowl silencers, those, those round, small, robust units with the spiral chamber that we had just talked about, those are actually made in our Winnipeg solution, uh, Winnipeg production facility, excuse me, uh, up there in Canada. So from a manufacturing standpoint, you know, like all things in Muratech, we hold ourselves to the highest of standards. The certifications that, that we are able to hold are a testament to that. We are ISO certified, which I'm sure many on this call are aware, uh, is no easy feat. And, it, you know, this ensures, that ISO certification ensures that, that um, you know, should Miratech become a provider of silencers for you, that we're going to be able to produce a high quality product that's efficient, reliable, consistent, and cost effective um, with how we make it in, in any of the facilities. In addition to being ISO certification, we also hold two other certifications as well, um, ATEX and CIRA, and then the DNV certification for our spark arresting units. So Mahmoud talked about uh, Mahmoud talked about how proud he is to be part of the engineering team, and he's he's a core part of our engineering team. Um, and I just like to echo that the the engineering team at Miratech is um, is is absolutely fantastic. You know, just like we hold ourselves to the highest standards from a manufacturing standpoint, we also hold ourselves to the highest standards from an engineering standpoint. Um, you know, and we have a we have a saying here at Miratech that custom custom is our standard. So we do have, from a silencer standpoint, we do have you know product item numbers that we can sell you. But a lot of the products that we work and that we work with our customers on, they're custom made products. And to help support that, we have an army full of engineers here that are all in house Miratech employees. This allows us to really work and partner with you to have a robust, efficient, and fast process in place so that we can engineer and design top quality products, top quality products for you. And then the last thing I want to touch on from an engineering standpoint, you know, in addition to having those army of, of incredibly great um, engineers in-house here at Miratech, we also have an online silencer sizing tool, which is part of the engineering department that everyone on this call could get access to. So we, we've opened this up to all of our customers. What this is, is this is a great tool that will help you size an exhaust system and, pr and provide you budgetary quotes on your, uh, on your own time, right? So all you need to do with this tool, all you really need is to know your engine temp, your, your flow and your back pressure, and you will be able to plug that information into this tool and design your exhaust system going from that turbo all the way out to the rain cap. Uh, we've had a lot of success in rolling this out to our customers and feedback is always overwhelmingly positive it's fast it's efficient uh, it's a robust it's a robust platform that will help you design those exhaust systems so um you know at the end of this call if you are interested please please contact us and we would be happy to roll this out um, and provide you some training to you and your team uh, should you wish to to use this product so at this point, that concludes our, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to click ahead to the thank you, but thank you. Um, for the moment, that concludes the presentation of our webinar section. So what I'd like to do it now is I'll turn it back over to Tim um, for our Q&A. Thanks for your time, everybody.